do y'all realize how country I sound? <laughs> oh my goodness. I, 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 somebody po I stumbled across and said, oh Lord, I sound like a redneck. Good. I don't know how to change that, but anyway, it is what it is. Sunday night, if, if none of y'all were here last weekend or especially Sunday morning, oh my goodness. It was amazing. Then Sunday night was another mass deliverance, and as things were kind of winding down, I was over here, and I can't remember now who, bam, came and got me, drug me to the other side over here, just come over here, somebody wants you to, you need to pray for a young lady, and so I go over there. She was in a really bad place, and I'll leave out all the details, but during that time, God spoke to her, and he, and he was giving her a word, and he said, I'm going to give you handfuls of, of purpose. Well, I remembered the story. It was in Ruth, found in Ruth, because I'd preached it almost 20 years ago. And so I didn't think much of the message. I thought, oh, I know that story. That's such a good story. Until Monday morning, I was walking through my house and I heard the Spirit of the Lord say to me, you know, when I say that, people go, oh, you heard the audible voice of God? No, it's like the devil who talks on your shoulder and tells you you're not worthy. Do you hear his audible voice or do you hear a voice that's deep inside of you saying that ringing in your head? You see, the Spirit of God talks that way and so he dropped it in my spirit. He said, if you can't handle the handful, he will never give you the field. I got real excited because I thought, you know what, Lord, I know what you're doing. I jotted that thing down because I knew what I was going to preach. He was telling me, this is what you're going to preach. And so I began to study this out. Now, most of y'all, when you hear the story of Ruth, you hear it told from the vantage point of the kinsman redeemer. I'm not going there this morning. If you don't know that story, go look it up and read it. <clears throat> what all that means. I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction. <clears throat> but before I do that, let me give you a little background on who Ruth is in the Bible. A severe famine has hit Bethlehem. So Elimelech, who is an Israelite who lives in Bethlehem, has moved his wife Naomi and his two sons to Moab to simply be in a place where they can try and survive. The Moabites were a pagan nation, which meant that they worshipped anything or anyone but the God of Israel. They were hostile toward the Israelites and they were constantly oppressing them. While living in enemy territory, Naomi and her uh, husband's two sons marry two Moabite girls. One's Orpha and one of them is Ruth. During the 10 years that they lived in this foreign country, the father dies. Then the two sons die. And now we have the three women who are all widows without children, which put them at an extreme disadvantage. There was no one there to help them. And then in Ruth chapter 1 verse 6 it says, Then Naomi, the mother-in-law, heard in Moab. She heard in enemy territory. She heard in the middle of her darkness something. She heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughter-in-laws got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. I love this. This is so God. In enemy territory, she heard what God was doing. In the day and the hour in which we are living, you need to understand God's still speaking and he's still moving and he's still up to something. It doesn't matter what this world looks like. It doesn't matter what the system is doing. I know the one who holds the override button. And I'm telling you, my focus isn't on what crazy people does. My focus is on my heavenly Father. And the Bible says he will keep those in perfect peace whose mind is what? Stayed on him. Get your mind on him to get your peace. So Orpha, the one sister-in-law or daughter-in-law, decides to stay in Moab with her people. But Ruth makes the decision to go back to Judah and make Israel's God her God and Israel's people her people. 
right in the middle of her darkest hour, she decides to leave everything that she has ever known, her country, her family, her security, everything she decides to leave. Why? Because something inside of her was prompting her, this is the way, walk ye in it. It wasn't something, y'all understand that, right? It was somebody. It was somebody. It's those small urgings. It's those small promptings that God wants to pick us up and, and have us go on with. So Ruth was drawn to go. go. It wasn't because her mother-in-law, Naomi, begged her to go. Because verse 8 tells us that Naomi looked at both of the girls and said, Y'all need to go back to your mama's house. Your mother's homes. That's what it says. Go back to mama. One of them decided, I'll take that offer. But instead, Ruth says, "Uh uh-uh. I have to go to Judah. I have to go to Judah. You know what Judah means? Come on. Praise. I got to go to praise. I got to go to praise. I'm living in a place. I'm going to leave this place. It's provided for me in enemy country, but I'm going back to praise. I'm going back to a place that I need to go back to. So Ruth has heard all about Judah. She's heard it, I'm sure, from her husband. She's heard it from her father-in-law, her mother-in-law, but she's never been there. And now she longs to go be there. Isn't that just like us? We're living in enemy territory. But just like Pastor McCray said, we don't know when Jesus is going to return, but he's going to return. Aren't you longing to make sure that you make his return? That there's nothing on this earth that keeps you back. No matter what's going on in your life, you need to focus and make sure, am I focused on him? Because that's the important thing. Now, Ruth and Naomi, they've made it back to Judah. They've made the travel back. Ruth knows that most Israelites reject her. She is despised because she is a Moabite. And according to the Jews, she is someone they didn't want anything to do with. Doesn't this sound like church sometimes? Hello. Oh, if they come in and they don't look like us, act like us, smell like us, uh, maybe they got liquor or, or, you know, stogie on their breath. Oh, uh, no, uh, no, mm mm. Let me tell you something. That's who God wants to build the church with because they're not intimidated because they've gone as low as you can go and they know who picked them up. So God wants to restore his people. He wants to bring those up that are rejected and abandoned. So she presses on, understanding that what I'm about to walk into isn't going to be real fun. Because now, again, she's still being brought along. There's something inside of her that tells her, I just got to go. She understands that her mother-in-law is too old to provide for herself. She's too old to go work in the fields. So all the responsibility of providing for the household is on Ruth's shoulders. How many of y'all feel like that sometimes? The weight of the world is on my shoulders. But I got news to tell somebody this morning. You're about to get to the right place at the right time and God's about to do something miraculous for you. So Ruth gets up one morning and she heads out looking for some food. And before she left the house, she looks at her mother-in-law and she says something very profound in Ruth 2.2. She says, let me go in the field and glean ears of corn after him or anyone in whose sight I shall find grace. Now, in a lot of the, the different versions, they say that I may find favor. But when you look back, it says, I shall find grace. I will get it. I will attain it. Let me tell you something. There's somebody in this room this morning that Robert and I happened to be with. At the moment, their faith walk ended when the answer came on the other end of the phone. And I looked at him and I said, you, my friend, have reckless faith. Y'all heard that message, right, that Lonnie preached? You see, radical faith is what God's looking for. 
That's what he's looking for. So Ruth says, look, I'm a Moabite. I'm a foreigner. People reject me. They can't stand me. But God is leading me, and I'm going to go find favor today. I'm going to go find a place that I can provide for my household. She didn't say, ooh, I hope I can find something for us to eat. Or maybe, she says, no, I'm going to go get it. See, God's looking for some I'm going to go get it people. He's looking for some that's so confident in their God that they know how he operates. They know that he said, I will provide all your need. I will, not I, if I feel like it, I will provide all your needs. He said, if you give, I shall give back unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, shall men give into your bosom. So God has given us promises. Oh, that's just black, black letters on white paper. It may be to you, but baby, that's in my spirit. He's going to provide all my needs. Hallelujah. So now God had commanded Israel to practice the process of gleaning. You can find that in Leviticus 19, 9 through 10. Gleaning was pretty simple. When the crops in a field were ready to be harvested, the farm workers would come in, cut them down, and if the harvesters accidentally dropped any of the grains, they were not allowed to pick them up. Not only that, they weren't allowed to go around the field the second time and get any leftovers that they had dropped. Because you see, God had purposed it. He said the leftovers and those things that are dropped are going to be designated by God for the poor and the needy. So I want to make sure that everybody's taken care of. So you better get all you're going to get on the first round because there's going to be a group that's going to pick up what other people don't think is very much. But it's still edible. It still brings sustenance to a person's life. Oh, it's still salvageable. Give me some people that they have the attitude. I'll take what's salvageable. Oh, what do you mean? I'm talking about people. Do you look at them and go, oh my God, they're such a, they'll never get off of drugs. Let me tell you something. You got to change your view. You got to change your outlook on life and what God is doing. Everywhere Jesus went, who did he hang out with? Who did he go to? Those that were desperate, those that were in a need. So Ruth sets out to find a field. She's going, I don't know how long it took her to get there. But in Ruth 2, 3, it says she happened. I just love that word. She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Now, you've got to understand, today the, the farmers have fence lines. That's my property north of that, or that's yours south of that. Back then, it's just all your fields went together. And so she's going along, and she happens to land in the field of Boaz, exactly where God would have her be. That was exactly in his field. You see, if Ruth would have stayed home like a lot of us want to sometimes and wait for God to just move on my behalf, right? Come on, come on, y'all know this message hurts. She might have still been waiting had she not. How many of us just sit and cross our arms and go, well, if God wants me to have, well, let's use this one. If God wants me to have the Holy Ghost, he'll just have me speak. No, baby, you got to open up your lips. You got to open up your mouth and you got to, by faith, begin to speak forth that heavenly language that he has given to you. So God moves for people who are doing something. He moves for people who are doing something. God moves for people that are working their faith. Why? James says, be a what of the word? Doer of the word, not just a hearer. Do you know how many people are so Bible smart they have no doer left in them? They know the Bible back and forward, but they never do anything with it. How about that day when we go, Isaiah Saldivar said this, this isn't my quote. He said, when we go before the Lord, don't we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. The question is, is he going to look at us and say, what have you done? Well done. What's the done in your life? We have to all do inventory on our life. What am I doing for and in the kingdom of God? Well done. Is he going to have a list? Is your list going to be this long? 
Or are you just going to have a blank column? Do you know you're going to get rewards when you get to heaven? Well, you shouldn't work for rewards. Well, honey, if you love Jesus, you're working anyway. And you don't care until you get there and you go, wow, look at the crown. I get to take off my head and land it at the feet of Jesus. Yeah, I want to bring him a gift. I do. I want to give him my best. If you're going to serve him, if you're going to work for somebody, aren't you going to give your best or are you just going to barely get by? Are you going to be the employee? They look and go, I need to advance her. That's who, because she's a hard worker, right? Can't we all spot the one that works to get out of work? Yeah, y'all all worked with them, haven't you? God says, I know the ones that are working to get out of work. I know the ones that look busy that aren't doing anything, but I'm looking for the doers because that's the one I'm going to show up in their field and I'm going to do something for them. Oh, Lord Jesus, my heart is beating 150 miles an hour. I'm so happy right now. So anyway, Ruth said, I shall find grace. I shall do this. So Boaz, the owner, he comes to check on what's happening in his field. Now, for those of you who don't know this story, Boaz is symbolical of Jesus. That's the kinsman redeemer. And what you need to hear this morning is, is that Jesus shows up in his field. If we come to church and Jesus, His Holy Spirit, does not show up here to change lives and to challenge us and to heal people and to set people free, we're in the wrong field. We're in the wrong field. We've got to be in a field that something is happening because Jesus shows up in His field. So Boaz looks out on his field, and this little woman, I don't know what makes her look different than all the other women that were out there gleaning, but she catches his eye. And he looks over to his foreman, and he asks, he goes, um, that young woman, who, who, who is that? Who, who is that out there? And his foreman goes, oh, that's the young woman that came back from Moab with Naomi. That girl's been here since this morning working hard and she only took one really quick break and she's right back out there. Boaz brings Ruth in. He looks at her and he says, I want you to stay in my fields. I want you to always come back to my field and glean in my field. I'm telling you, God has a field for each and every one of us to work in. Well, I work in my church. Yes, this is a field. This isn't the only field. Y'all get it, right? This is where we come to get equipped. This is where we come to learn. This is where we come and fine-tune our instruments. And then we leave out those doors after a place of worship, and the work begins when we walk outside. And we go out into the other field and begin to do things for God. So he tells her, he says, stay close to the women. I like that. You know what he's telling her? You need a new circle of friends. How many knows when somebody gets born again, all your friends change? All those partiers, all those gossipers, all those that can't keep their mouths, they just change. Hallelujah. Somebody should have shouted right there. I've commanded the young men not to touch you, Boaz said. In my field, you will be protected. Let me tell you something. When you start facing the enemy, you have nothing to fear. For I have given you the authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm or hurt you. You'll be protected in my field. When you get in the field you're supposed to be in. He looks at her and he says, and when you're thirsty, there's water that the boys drew up. You can go drink of that water anytime you want to. You're never going to go thirsty in God's field. Ruth is so overwhelmed. The kindness that this man, who she doesn't even know who he is yet, has just shown her. She falls at his feet and she thanks him and she asks the question. <laughs> this sounds so like us. She says, why have I found grace? Why have I found such favor? And I just want to say, you silly woman, 
When you left the house and looked at Naomi, you said, I shall find grace. I am going to find favor. And what happens? We do the same thing. We stand on the Word of God. We expect God to move. And when He does, we're shocked. How did this happen? Oh, you stood in faith. See, that's how faith operates. You, you, something big happens in your life. You stand and you wait. You see, this is where my husband and I are. We're standing in that faith realm, but we're waiting for the shock day. We're waiting for, oh, my God, Lord, you did it. You did it. It's coming. You hear me? Where are you at this morning? Are you leaving out going, I'm going to go, and I shall find it without a shadow of a doubt? So she's stunned. God has moved. She's receiving it. She's overwhelmed that God had done this. You know, Ruth didn't have this attitude. Ruth didn't stand up and... You like my hair? <laughs> if you weren't at the Deliverance Conference, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Uh, just ask Olivia later. She'll tell you all about it. So <laughs> she doesn't stand up and flip her hair and go, you know what? Well, it's about time somebody noticed me. I deserve to be blessed. You ever run across people like that? Oh, good. I'm not the only one. I deserve to be blessed. Not once did we ever read where Ruth was saying, Oh, God, all the bad things have come my way. It's just terrible. Did I tell you? My, not anything to do with Tanya. My husband died. My father-in-law died. My brother-in-law died. My one sister-in-law that could have helped me glean in the fish. She left, and I'm stuck with my old mother-in-law. Don't say nothing. So she doesn't say any of this stuff. She doesn't bring out any of her struggles, any of her experiences. She just wants to know, why is all this happening to me? I am a foreigner. I'm just a Moabite. I'm just an outsider. I'm just less than everybody else. And that's exactly who God came to. He came to you, did he not? He came to you. But you see, well, I never had that. See, working in deliverance, I didn't realize how protected I was from a lot of things that happens in the world and people's lives. I mean, I really was greatly protected and preserved, not that anybody else wasn't, but I'm just saying the hurts that people have gone through has just been tremendous. And I look at them and I go, you have to love Jesus in a different way. Just like Sister Becky, you know, she gives her testimony that she OD'd and, and they, were, they already had her body bag ready. See, she knows Jesus in a way that I'll never know him because she came within a heartbeat of death. I never have. So I know she loves him in a way that I'll never understand, but I love him in the way that he's worked in my life. You see, and it's the same with you. Don't ever compare your experiences or your testimony with somebody else because your testimony is your testimony. It is your walk. And what God has done in your life is just as important as what he's done in somebody else's because God shows up. So, Boaz, you know, he's all excited and, and, and he says, oh, she says, well, why have I found, why have I found all this favor? Well, you asked for it. And then Boaz, who is symbolical of Jesus, he said, oh, I've been told all about you, what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland, and you came to live with the people you did not know before. Let me tell you something. It's so fun going to jail. Because when we don't know anything about these girls, we don't search them out before we walk in to see what they're even in there for. We don't know anything. And when God starts speaking to them and speaking in their lives and their mouths, like, how did you know that? And I keep telling them, God knows who you are. God knows who you are. God knows who you are. And then when he can take the most intimate, delicate thing in your life and reach in and touch it, it'll mess you up too. 
And so Ruth here hears, oh, God, he knows all about me. He knows my struggle. He knows what I've done for people that nobody else knows. He knows all about me. So Boaz, where was he? Where was Ruth when they had a conversation? They were in the field. They were in the field. Did y'all get that? She was in the field working. The owner shows up in the field. I think I'll just stay at the house in the lazy boy recliner, and when God wants me to do something, he'll just pop the chair down, and he'll have my phone ring three times, hang up, four times, hang up, and five times, hang up. No, she was in the field. She was in the field. When Boaz, when Jesus shows up, he'll show up in your field. So let me ask you a question. Where does God speak to you at? Where does he speak to you? People say, oh, I hear from God when I go to church. He speaks there. That's great. That's a maximum. If you come on Wednesdays of four hours a week, what about the 164 remaining hours of the week? Are you hearing from God, or are you just coming here expecting to hear from God? Do you know what his voice is like? Do you know how he speaks to you? Do you know the majority of the time when he speaks to you? I'll guarantee you, you are all alone. Is that true? But I'm surrounded by people. It doesn't matter. When you're alone with him, he drops things. I've never really, uh, not too many times with Robert and I together praying in the mornings before he goes to work or whatever, do we ever get a word from the Lord. We pray to him together as a couple. And then we go about our business. I walk through the house and poof, he just drops something in my spirit. I'm reading the Bible by myself. Poof, something becomes alive. I'm doing chores. I'm doing yard work. I'm riding a lawnmower if my husband will ever let me do it again. And, and, and God speaks. Poof. How many have it, that experience? You see what I'm saying? He comes to you. I'm not talking about because you're working in your house. I'm talking about because you are probably thinking about him. Your mind is on him and he comes to speak to you. It's when you're alone driving down the road. He speaks to you, does he not? He speaks to you. So Ruth's answer showed up when she was working in the field. There were other ladies there. But they weren't working side by side. That's my piece of grain. Get your hands off of that corn. I'll beat you up. You hear me? Let it go. That's mine. I saw it first. No, she's out working. She's doing her part. And Jesus shows up, Boaz. She could have gone to any number of fields. You know, the word field in the original Greek means a spot. Do y'all know y'all have a spot? Y'all have a spot in God's field. But she was led to that spot because it had a purpose for her. So she's at the right place at the right time because God wanted her to be there. So Ruth, she's caught Boaz's eye. Now he's looking going, whoo, yeah. She's a Moabite, but there's just something about that girl. And he invites her over to come and sit and eat a meal with him and his servants. A whole different message. Not only that, but Boaz did something that the religious Jews would have had a hissy fit over. Y'all know what that is, right? Woo! They had a common rap. They'd have been a bunch of Pharisees. He pulls up a chair, sitting at the table with the servants, and he reaches over and he serves a foreigner. He serves Ruth, that rejected, downtrodden, cast out girl. That's what he did. We look at this and go, oh, isn't that so sweet? They had lunch together. But in Jesus' days, Jews refused to eat with Gentiles. Because according to Peter in Acts 10, 28, it was unlawful for a man who was a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit them. Aren't you glad Jesus changed all that? Jesus sits with the servants. 
He loves socializing with foreigners. He loves coming to the lost because after all, that's who he came for, right? I came to seek and to save the lost. That's who I'm seeking. Oh, well, what about me? Oh, just keep working in my field. Y'all keep working. Y'all keep gleaning. But I'm looking for the lost. Well, you mean, Jesus, you don't see me and you don't know what I'm doing for the kingdom of God? Just keep working. I'm looking for the lost. I'm looking for the Ruths. That's who I'm looking for because I need to find the Ruths because I've heard all about you. I've heard all about those that I'm wanting to bring them in. So anyway, so Jesus, I talked about this earlier. He preferred to hang out with the downcast the downtrodden, the messed up, jacked up, weird, whatever. Because who was it that constantly gave him a fit? Pharisees. Religion. Religious people. Religion. Let me tell you something. Cut your religion off and get in a relationship. The Pharisees were the very ones that were instrumental in getting Jesus to the cross. Oh, he was going, but they were used as an instrument to put him there. The biggest fit that's happening in the church world now is all the religious people coming against the things of God. I bind the spirit of religion in this house and take authority over it. I cast it down in the name of Jesus. Yes, you're to know your word, but he is the word. And how he operates is how we operate. So anyway, that was a side note. So anyway, they, the, the lunch is over. She has a little bit of leftovers. She takes her napkin. My daddy used to do this for his dogs. He'd get the bones and wrap them up in a, in a napkin to take them home to his babies. She takes leftover food. I believe she didn't need it all because she wanted to take some of this good stuff back to Naomi. So she packs it all up. Instantly she gets up. She goes back out to the field and she starts gleaning. Boaz looks at her and thinks, oh my God, this girl's amazing. Look at her out there doing that. Look at her. She didn't ask me. She just got back to going to work. And he looks at his workers and he says, listen, I want you to let fall also some handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and don't give her a hard time. Did you hear that? Boaz, Jesus, she's headed this way. She's gleaning. So y'all just, when you you get the big harvest, I just want you to take some and just go bloop because she's right behind you. And don't give her a hard time when she picks it up. God has handfuls of purpose for his people. I want to give you something that you don't have to work for. I'm going to lay it there, but you're still working for it. Does that make sense? You're not going to have to work as hard as you used to. He says, just let her collect the grain, and wherever she wants to collect it, it's okay. Now, for those of you who may be thinking, man, Ruth was lucky that she stumbled up into Boaz's field. I'm going to tell you something. The believer's life is not based off of chance, circumstances, or luck. It's based on being obedient to God and his rewards, listening to the voice of God. So Ruth gets to work. She's out in the field. But then, you know, she's beginning to see, man, these guys are really sloppy gleaners. I'm glad I chose this dude wearing the purple pants or whatever. Woo! I'm so, or dress. I'm so excited. Boaz looks at his guys. He says, listen, here's what else I want you to do. I, I, I want you to intentionally leave lots of it there for her. You see, she didn't realize that God was giving her something on purpose for a purpose. And there's things in our life that God is giving us on purpose for a purpose. Purpose means intentional, deliberate, by design, by choice. Boaz made some decisions behind the scenes that affected Ruth's life and her very future. There are people in this room this morning. 
God is making decisions behind the scenes on behalf of your life. You have no clue what he's doing, but he's doing it. And you don't even know God's laying this all out for me. I've come to tell somebody this morning, God is going to drop some things in your life. Good things. Intentional. Deliberate. By design, by his choice, he wants to set you up so that you can be a blessing. He's going to bless you to bless. Blessing means benefit, something that produces good or helpful results. When you're chasing down somebody who doesn't know which way to turn, God says, I'm going to make you a blessing. Well, my Lord, Lord, I didn't know I was going to run a marathon to chase them down so that they could get set free. Oh, I'm going to make you a blessing this morning. You see, we always think blessing has to do with money, and it's not always that way. Do you know that you can be a blessing when you lay hands upon the sick and obey the Word of God and they recover? Do you know? know that you can be a blessing a benefit that brings good results when you pray heaven down for somebody that's walking through hell at this moment do you not know that you can be a blessing or a benefit to somebody who who needs the Holy Ghost and they're having a time praying through but you just sit right there and hammer through with them look my brother's standing up why don't some of y'all learn how to stand up in the name of Jesus and shout me down real good how about this Are you going to be a blessing or a benefit to others that you don't fear any demons or you're not intimidated by them, but you look them in the face and you tell them, you come up and out in the name of Jesus and you set them free. I'm going to tell you something. You are a benefit. You are a blessing. You've been blessed to be a blessing to other people. This will make sense in a second. How about this? You're a blessing, a benefit to someone with good results when you preach the word of God to them and all of a sudden, out of 50 messages they've ever heard, that one five-minute conversation with you had the light come on and they came into the kingdom of God. You are blessed to be a blessing. You're blessed to be a blessing. Think about this. Long before Ruth ever made it into that field, that corn had been planted about two to four months prior. Four months if it was uh, uh, spring corn. Eight months if it was winter. (laughs) I wonder, in this room, how many of y'all are about to walk into a field that God's been preparing for you four months ago? Eight months ago. Oh, the barley only took two months ago. I wonder who's in here about to get a harvest. Oh, I was in the middle of it last week with somebody. But I'm telling you, I've come to declare and decree. I don't know about y'all, but my harvest field is just about ready to walk into. And when I show up there, I know that my Boaz, I know that my Jesus is going to be there. And I'll know that I know that I know. You see, today... What God has put in motion months ago, maybe years ago for some of you. I know with Robert and I, it's been years in a certain area. You've come to glean. You've come to get a little something, something. You know, gleaning isn't easy work. You know that, right? She had to bend over and pick it up. She had to pick up what other people thought wasn't even worth it. It was the fragments of the harvest. It was just a little piece. Maybe it was a half a piece of corn. Maybe it was run over by the donkey. Maybe whatever it was. But she was willing to pick up whatever was left behind. She didn't need the whole big kitten caboodle. She said, I can take little and do something with it. It's the same stuff, and I'm just going to have to get a little bit more. In gleaning, not only is it hard work, it's laborious, but you got to stoop over. You got to bend over. You got to humble yourself before God. You got to say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. I fall at your feet. I give you my life. I don't understand it. I humble myself. 
But as long as I'm bending over, let me just keep on working. Let me keep on getting what I can find. And all of a sudden, can you imagine? This is so funny. I just thought about this. She's going along. She's getting a trickle here and there. Oh, there's a good piece. And then next thing she knows, it looks like there's a whole row of corn sitting in front of her. She probably looks around and goes, who else is, what's going on? And all of a sudden, her apron starts to get fuller and fuller. She, or her bushel, whatever she's got, her basket. She starts packing and stacking, baby. She says, I'm not going to throw it in. I'm going to line it up real good so I can get all the room I can in my basket. Hallelujah. <laughs> How many of you this morning been gleaning? And you're getting a little here and a little there. But God says, I'm about to drop some handfuls on purpose. And when you see that, you need to know that trail's going to lead you to somewhere. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be exciting. How do I know? Ooh, let me tell you. Because when God spoke and he says, if you can't handle the handful, he'll never give you the field. I knew exactly what he was saying. If you'll never labor... You'll never own a field. Because when you finish reading the rest of the story about Ruth, who does she marry? Boaz. She went from working in the field to owning it. Got it? Oh, I'm willing to work in your field, Lord. I'm willing to labor to get just whatever I can. Oh, honey, hang on a second. When you become born again, the Holy Spirit comes and joins your spirit. And at that moment, you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And if I'm not mistaken, the Bible says that you become the bride of Christ. Woo, what does that mean? That means what Jesus has, I have. Where Jesus goes, I can go. What Jesus owns, I can own. Jesus did it, we can do it. I'm the bride of Christ. I'm in his field. Somebody getting what I'm putting down this morning. Woo! You own some stuff. You own some. You ever heard the expression, ooh, they own that. Woo, they grabbed that microphone. They own that microphone. Not ownership as in, I paid for it, it's mine. Like you grabbed hold of it and you just dug your teeth into it. You own some things. And there's people in here, you've grabbed hold of what God is doing and you've owned it. You said, I know that I'm in the field I'm supposed to be in. I'm working in Boaz's field. And now I realize after today, I own that field. I don't have to go out on that part anymore and get out there physically and glean. God's going to bring the servants to come along, to come alongside of us and help one another. But now, Lord, I can go out in that field anytime I want to. Hallelujah. Jesus has no prenumps. Now, all you rich folk in the house, that before you got married and you had a prenup signed, Jesus said, I didn't do that. I didn't have to do that. You know why? Because I wanted you to have everything I got. Everything that I own. Everything that I have. Everything I produce. If you're married, what your husband owns, in my case, what my husband is mine. Even him, I have paperwork for him. <laughs> it's mine. So if God says that I can lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover, it's mine. Because I'm joined with him, right? You'll get it this afternoon. <laughs> now, here's a little add-on. Do you know that God considers you his field? 1 Corinthians 3.9 For we are co-workers, fellow workers with God. 
We're just doing this thing together. We're doing life together with God, right? Yes? Okay, good. And it says, you are God's field. I'm a field. I think I'm a pastor, but anyway, whatever. <laughs> I'm a field. I'm a big acreage field. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Have we planted our field? What are we planting in our field? Is somebody walking up the road and sees your luscious cornfield? Plant it and go, I need some of that. Well, I don't quite understand, Melinda. I ain't got no property. Oh, 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 yes, you do. Because the Bible tells us in Luke 8, 11 that God's word is a seed. And every time I put it in my life, I'm planting something that's going to turn into a harvest. And when somebody comes along, maybe they're drawn to your personality. Maybe they're drawn to your faith. Maybe they're drawn to your charisma. Maybe they're drawn to the power of God that's in your life. Maybe they're drawn to you in that funny heavenly language that you're praying. Are they going to turn and come into your field? How many people are walking into your field, your life, wanting what you have planted? Got quiet in the house. You're a field. God expects you to plant something. He expects a harvest to come through your life. And he expects you to be nice to people and to bring them in and let them glean from your life. Here's what the church world has done. It's mine. I worked for it. Figure it out yourself. Mm -mm. I ain't got time. Got to go get my nails done. I don't do my nails. I got to go get my nails done. Oh, no, no. I'm just not in the mood today to put on makeup. <laughs> uh -uh. That's an hour process. You're asking too much. What is in your field? Are you being like Boaz, like Jesus and saying, I'm just going to open up my field? And you can come get what you want to. Oh, that's the preacher's job. Really? I thought I'm to equip the saints. I'm supposed to put instruments in your hands. You're the workers. I'm supposed to feed the sheep so that the sheep won't be famished so they can go out and work their field. Oh, well, aren't you working a field? Yep. I sure am. So is Lonnie. Oh, yeah, baby. Never mind. I would tell you the crop that's in here, but somebody might get offended, so I won't say anything. I'll let your imagination go. I'm cutting up with you. <laughs> this morning, here's what I want. I want you to declare and decree, Lord, I'm a field. I'm a field. And, Lord, send them to me. I won't put up any fences. I won't have any gates. Lord, my field is wide open to whoever needs me. Amen? God is going to drop some handfuls on purpose on your life. Pay attention. He wants to do something great and mighty. My first question this morning is, is it well with you? Do you know Jesus this morning? Because if you don't, that's the most important thing that could ever happen in this place today is that we're all in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. If you're not hearing from him, then you need to ask yourself this. Don't, don't be mad at me. Do I really belong to him? If you're not hearing God, then are you, do you really belong to him? Well, I don't like the way you, you're saying that, Melinda. No, I'm asking. I'm, I'm being honest. Because there's a lot of people that say, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? And didn't we do that in your name? And, and he's going to look at them and go, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Because why? I never knew you. Your busyness, I told you this a while back, many, many years ago, Joan Pierce got on to me. Melinda, you're too busy being a Martha and you're not being a Mary. You see, working in the church 
that's good. But when you plant and you put stuff in other people's lives, that's the work that God's looking for. So we want to make sure that we're right with him. Every day should be a day of repentance. Lord, forgive me for the known and unknown, for the dumb and the dumbest, for the, boy, why couldn't I keep this shut, or what have you. Be careful. We've got to be careful. There's going to be a great falling away. I don't want to be in that number. I want to be here. I want to be a good field. How about you? 